storm partly because uh, of all the possibilities that are available from it. So uh, in a way, it has enabled people to think do things like uh, create novel things without uh, putting in as much. So some of it appears kind of like magic. Um, partly uh, because uh, of all the possibilities that are available from it. So uh, in a way, it has enabled people to think do things like uh, create novel things without uh, putting in as much. So some of it appears kind of like magic. Um, partly because uh, of all the possibilities that are available from it. So uh, in a way, it has enabled people to think. OK, I was hearing my voice back. So maybe uh, it's been fixed now. So uh, let us see how generative AI works and how generative AI models or generative models in general work. Um, and I'll try to take a somewhat uh, less uh, math in intensive view of uh, these processes. So uh, to give an overview of my talk, uh, we'll talk about generative models, a little bit of history of these models, uh, and we'll then talk about autoencoders, uh, diffusion models as they developed in time, finally ending with uh, transformers and uh, large language models. So uh, what are generative models? So generative models aim to generate new data points similar to a particular training set. So for example, uh, in a model, for example, a model that takes in an image of a cat and uh, outputs the label cat is a discriminative model or a classification model. Uh, so essentially what it is doing is taking a certain data point and uh, mapping it to uh, a particular class. What a generative model would do instead is that it would take a label, for example, say a label like cat and generate a corresponding image of a cat. So uh, during the training process, what we aim to do with a generative model is that it should learn the distribution of data. That is, it should be able to uh, look at uh, the kind of data that's, that it has been given and be able to generate uh, novel data points that are similar to the data that it has seen. So it should not just replicate, I mean, it should not just replicate what it has seen, but be able to generate novel content, but uh, that novel content should be from the same distribution. So uh, it should be able to generate unseen in instances by learning from the data set. And uh, generative models can be used in a large number of cases. So they can be there in, I mean, you can use generative models to generate uh, data points but they're also used in image, text, and uh, other kinds of uh, creative fields. So uh, let's take a look at a very, very simple generative model. Can you take a linear model and turn it into a generative model? So yeah, it's quite possible to do that. So essentially, a, a, normal, uh, a normal linear model is you take a set of data points and you do a best fit and you get a particular uh, linear model that is a representation of the data points that were given to the linear model. Now, uh, from these data points, you can estimate the parameters. For example, if there is an error around this uh, uh, best fit line, you can take the error of these data points and uh, find out what's the mean, what's the variance of this error. And what you could do is then you can generate new data points by sampling from these feature distributions. So essentially, uh, let's say if the error is a Gaussian, I mean, if the data points have an error that is distributed, normally distributed with a certain mean and variance, you could generate a random variable with the same mean and variance and uh, put it along this data, uh, uh, put it along the line and uh, add this random error that you have generated. And you would get a new set of data points that follow the same distribution that the original set of data points from which you, you had learned this particular distribution. So uh, you could see that you have created a generative model that learned from the distribution that was given to it and uh, would be able to, uh, essentially, if you were to take the new set of data points, you would be able to get the same uh, model that uh, generated the original set of data points. And this can sometimes be quite useful when, uh, let's say, uh, you would like to release data that uh, follows a certain distribution, but you cannot release actual data, for example, because of privacy concerns or uh, 
not having rights to distribute a particular data set and so on. So in that case, what you could do is you learn from a particular data set and you you generate new data which has the same distribution and you you can release it so that other people can learn from the data, run experiments on it and so on without the original data being exposed. Okay, so uh, that's this is an example of an extremely simple uh, generative model. Now we'll go on to some other kinds of models uh, that are a lot more complicated than this simple model that we uh, just saw. So just to give a brief uh, idea of the journey of uh, uh, generative AI models, uh, the main point where we might think of starting with is uh, autoencoders. So autoencoders have a longer history, but uh, in 2013, uh, we saw the development of variational autoencoders. And I'll spend a little bit of time on uh, variational autoencoders in this talk. Uh, then in 2014, uh, Google's uh, Dr. Ian Goodfellow came out with generative adversarial networks. And these were very exciting for several years. A huge number of variants of uh, generative adversarial networks came around that uh, were optimized for a lot of different use cases. In uh, 2017, the big paper called Attention is All You Need came out, which uh, introduced transformers. And uh, that has been the bedrock of a lot of generative AI following uh, since then. So in 2018, we saw the release of the first uh, GPT. Uh, 2019 was GPT-2, which at that point was uh, held back from public release for quite some time because uh, it was actually said like it might be too dangerous to release it into the wild. But then uh, in 2020, we saw GPT-3, and lately we are now working with GPT-4 and uh, later models. Uh, these are all, uh, the GPTs are text-based models, but uh, on the top here are uh, Midjourney, Imagine, uh, Stable Diffusion, which are all uh, generative image models. We'll talk a bit about them as well. And, uh, and now we have a large range of uh, generative models that are accessible to everyone. And I think even in this room, I would think that a fairly large number of fraction of you would be using generative models in some form or the other, be it ChatGPT or Google Bard or uh, many of the other cases. Okay, so uh, let's start with autoencoders. Uh, what are autoencoders? So as the name uh, indicates, an autoencoder is a, a neural network that is that encodes data to itself. So uh, what it does is it essentially is trained to copy its input to its output, but with a bottleneck in between. So uh, if you look at the top uh, neural network like representation with the two kitten faces uh, on either end, what this network is doing is uh, taking in an image and uh, passing it through a small bottleneck layer. So you can see that let's say uh, you have a large number of uh, data points starting going in and you have the same number of data points going out, but in between the number of data points is uh, very small. So what the network has to do is to find a compressed representation of this data. And uh, once your network is trained, essentially what will happen is that the network would have learned an embedding that represents the data that has been that it has been uh, trained on. So essentially what the network is learning is a compressed representation of the data. So it, uh, to give a slightly non-technical uh, non-technical uh, idea of what uh, embedding or a representation is, is uh, for example, let's say you can take an image of a person and the image of a person is a fairly uh, high dimensional representation of the person because every point in that image uh, is, it can take a certain number of values. So it's a very large, uh, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that has a fairly high, uh, large amount of information representing it. But you could also compress this information down to something like, let's say, the distance between the eyes of a person, the uh, length of the nose of a person, uh, it, what color the person is, what color the eyes of a person is. And just by that, you get a much more sm a smaller representation of the same image, but it's not an exact representation. But you might have captured the salient features of a person's image. So what you've done is you've taken a compressed output and this is a lossy compression. So you won't get the same uh, 
visual of a person back, but you can still describe the person in a far lesser amount of information than you, uh, than a image would have described. So, uh, so this brings us to like, what is an embedding? So an embedding is essentially a low dimensional vector. So one of the most commonly used embeddings is uh, PCA, uh, principal competence analysis. So the essential idea of an embedding is that it has a fewer dimensions than the uh, object that it uh, that the embedding is uh, representing. And essentially what an embedding algorithm does, so for example, what PCA does is it maps a point in the ambient space X to its embedding space, uh, to its embedding edge. So the embedding is much, much smaller than the object that you start with. So uh, the main point, uh, so let's come to come back to autoencoders. So how do autoencoders uh, learn? So autoencoders are essentially designed to learn the salient features of a data set. So what uh, we have is that, uh, as I was saying, that the information in an autoencoder passes through a bottleneck. So an autoencoder is, uh, just as we learned in yesterday's talk, it's essentially a neural network with a large number of, uh, I mean, with neurons in the beginning and the same number of neurons at the, uh, neurons in the input and the same number of neurons on the output side. And uh, in between these, you have a series of hidden layers with a hidden layer in the middle that is, uh, let's say, a small, uh, a much smaller layer. And the idea is that as information passes through this bottleneck or the smaller uh, layer, the hidden layer in the middle would learn a representation of the data set that is uh, much more, I mean, it's learning a, the salient features of the particular data set that it has been uh, trained on. And uh, the interesting thing about autoencoders is also that in case your decoder is linear, that is all the activation functions are linear, then uh, and the loss function is a mean squared error, the autoencoder simply reduces to uh, the principal competence analysis of the data set that is uh, being given to, you, given to it. So you'll get essentially the top uh, A uh, principal competence depending on the uh, size of the bottleneck layer, which might be, which would be K here. And in case, I mean, that's with a linear set of activation functions. If you have a nonlinear activation functions, then, the autoencoder can learn more powerful nonlinear uh, generalizations of uh, PCA. Okay, uh, I'll take a pause at this point, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take right here. Okay, so uh, autoencoders can learn uh, uh, the hidden representation of a data set. Uh, but they're not very convenient because the representation that you learn from an autoencoder is not uh, might be gappy and uh, does not necessarily have a particular distribution. So the next step that people came up with are was uh, variational autoencoders. So what variational autoencoders are is that uh, you not just have a hidden layer, but you also impose a condition on the uh, what kind of uh, distribution the points in the hidden layer have. So an autoencoder's training objective is mainly to is is to minimize the reconstruction error. That is, you try and reconstruct the original data set as closely as possible. Uh, with a variational autoencoder, what we try to do is to minimize the uh, reconstruction error plus regularize the latent space. So what I mean by regularizing the latent space is that we want the distribution of the points in the hidden layer or the uh, the middle layer to be, to follow a certain distribution. Usually we want that to follow a normal distribution with uh, a unit variance. So uh, what we have is a certain, I mean, we impose the condition that the points in the hidden layer have uh, a normal distribution. And that can be quantified by uh, using the KL divergence. So essentially KL divergence can quantify the difference between two different uh, probability distributions. And what we want is that distribution to be as close to the normal distribution as possible. Hey, so uh, what... sorry to interrupt you. Um, yeah. So in case of a normal autoencoder, 
uh, mm -hmm. you're saying that it's uh, uh, making it smaller. The, the representation is smaller. And so mm -hmm. the information required is less. But mm -hmm. uh, if I consider the, the hidden layers uh, activity as well as the weights, mm -hmm. so uh, I can say that the information is sort of distributed in the activity of the hidden layer and the weights as well. Right, because the input didn't have any weights to start with. Yes. So, so the weights are learned by the model. So uh, what we are, I mean, what we are trying, what we are seeing is that the data itself can be represented uh, just using the uh, just using the inputs to the hidden layer, and the model can reconstruct the data given the weights that it has uh, just by using the. Uh, just by using what what the data uh, the uh, data entered in the hidden layer itself, so the parameters of the model are a part of it, but uh, the data can be represented just by the uh, hidden layer itself. All right, thanks. Okay. So in a variational autoencoder, what we have is that we impose an additional condition that uh, the hidden layer, the points in the hidden layer also have a certain distribution. Usually the distribution is a Gaussian distribution. Uh, now, the good part about that, and now the interesting part about that is that now we have a smooth representation of uh, the uh, distribution of the input within this hidden layer and you can sample from this distribution so now that we have imposed that it has an the hidden layer has a uh, normal distribution you can generate new unseen data by sampling from the latent space so essentially we can sample from a gaussian distribution with the given mean and variance and uh, uh, plug those numbers in into the hidden layer and we can get a reconstruction of the data set which has the same distribution which is coming from the same distribution as what the network was trained on. So this is an example of a fairly powerful kind of uh, generative model here. Okay. So for example, this can this has been used to generate uh, uh, images. So you can see that these are images of people that do not exist. Uh, it, these are not as good as some of the methods that we'll uh, discuss later. But the interesting part is that uh, you can also apply different kinds of conditions. So you can have different uh, neurons in the hidden layer correspond to different parts of an image. So you can condition the training uh, in such a way that you could have a particular neuron, say, uh, encode how smiley a person should be or whether it would be smiley or frowny or so on, and uh, things like that. So you can have uh, the variational autoencoder uh, be a lot more versatile than a normal autoencoder. Uh, since a variational autoencoder is fairly simple, I wanted to show you how you can code one up and we can uh, look at uh, how a variational autoencoder would work with a small training data set called an MNIST uh, data set. Um, let me zoom into this. Are you able to see my window here? Okay, close this. Okay, so what we'll do in this particular exercise is uh, create a small autoencoder, a variational autoencoder, and train it over the MNIST dataset. So for those who are not familiar with MNIST, uh, I'll give you an idea. So MNIST is a set of uh, handwritten digits uh, dataset. I think it originates from the US Postal Office, which was interested in uh, reading zip codes on uh, envelopes. So you have a large number of digits that uh, are handwritten, and we would like to classify them between zero and nine. So you have 10 possible categories. And here I've shown this top row here shows what kind of digits you might expect to see. So since they're handwritten, uh, all of them have certain variations, but you would still expect them to uh, be, I mean, so you can easily classify them, except that sometimes they're difficult, but uh, largely they're easily classified as one of the 10 classes from uh, zero to nine. Now let's see if we can train a small neural network, uh, a small autoencoder to be able to reconstruct these images uh, or like uh, sample from the distribution of these images. So uh, I'll not go too deep into all the code, 
but uh, I want to highlight certain parts. So this is the encoder part of the uh, neural network. What it does is it takes in a image which is uh, 28 by 28 pixels in size and uh, it's flattened into a single uh, vector which is 28 by 28 in size. Uh, then we pass it to a dense layer, which is essentially another neural network. I mean, another layer in the neural network. We've chosen 128 neurons here. And the activation that I've selected is the uh, ReLU activation. Uh, and then uh, I have the, and I straight away have the uh, middle layer or the latent, la uh, latent dimension here. So in this case, I've left it as latent dimension, which I can vary uh, to see what's the effect of changing the uh, latent dimensions uh, and uh, okay this lets us sample from this layer to see what the mean and variance of this uh, of the hidden layer is uh, then we have a decoder which is exactly the same um, so the decoder has 128 neurons to start with and an output layer which is 784 which is uh, 28 by 28 and this reshapes the uh, 784 length vector back into a 28 by 28 uh, matrix. Okay, and here we define the loss. So we have uh, the KL loss, which is the how far away from a normal distribution this is. And we have the regular loss, which is the uh, mean squared error. And this is uh, code for training and so on. So uh, let's see how far we can get with a latent dimension of just two. So a two dimensional, uh, a latent dimension of just two for all the digits that we encounter. So uh, I will start training my neural network. So in this case, uh, let's see, hopefully it'll work well. So I'm training it for 30 epochs and we can see that it starts with a certain uh, callback library loss as well as the mean squared error. And uh, the number of data points that I'm giving it are 938. So it has 938 different uh, digits uh, that are in the network, uh, in the data set. It's not very large, so it may not generalize that well, but it allows us to do this uh, training quickly. And uh, I'm training it for 30 epochs. That means it's running over the same uh, data set uh, 30 times. And as you can see, like our training loss is uh, going lower and lower. Uh, the KL loss is going slowly, very lower. Uh, the uh, reconstruction loss is uh, declining much more rapidly. Okay, so it's almost done and it's done. So now we can, uh, what we can do is we can sample from the latent space and see what kind of reconstruction do we get over here. So you can see that the top row is the data set that was given to it, the original images, and the bottom row is the images that are uh, generated by the network. And you can see that uh, it's not perfect, but we've still gotten quite a bit of the way through. And uh, if you had trained more or if you had a larger uh, data set to work with, we would have possibly gotten uh, better results. But uh, some of the advantages of variational autoencoders are that they're reasonably fast to train uh, because these are neural, neural networks, you can train them on GPUs and so on. And it works uh, and the results are uh, fairly good, at least for certain kinds of uh, data sets. Okay, uh, any questions here? Sir, how do we choose the appropriate activation function between ReLU, Sigmoid, or Softmax? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, so most of the time, uh, the activation functions are chosen by trial and error. Uh, for hidden layers and so on, uh, often an activation function like ReLU or Sigmoid works reasonably well. One downside of Sigmoids is that uh, at the edges of a Sigmoid, the um, gradient is fairly low. So that means that the training can be uh, slow. So one advantage of a ReLU is that its uh, gradient is... Uh, fixed, I mean, regardless of the of where you are on the ReLU. Um, but it doesn't have, I mean, but because it has a gradient of zero below zero, 
uh, it doesn't uh, it sometimes may not train well so there is leaky relu where you have a smaller gradient on the side below a zero so that works uh, pretty well for the cases where the activation function is fixed are the output layer. So for example, if we want the output to be a regression, then you would want something like uh, a ReLU or a similar function so that the regression can output anything it likes. If you have a classification output, then uh, if it's binary classification, you might want something like a sigmoid. If it's multi-class classification, then you would want uh, something like a softmax so that uh, you have a probabilistic output where the probabilities add up to one as you would expect them to. Um, so uh, that's how you would, you would be able to select what kind of an activation function you would like. Um, I hope that answers the question. Okay, so, uh, Going to the next major development for gen uh, for generative uh, AI uh, was the development of generative adversarial networks. So these uh, were a major thing between 2014 and 2018 or so, when a large number of different kinds of generative adversarial networks were developed for a lot of different use cases. So generative adversarial networks, as their name indicates, have two parts to them. One is that they're generative, and the adversarial indicates that the generative net, uh, GANs or generative adversarial networks, they work by having two neural networks competing against each other. So what you have is two networks. These are two independent networks. One is a generative network that generates a data set. Often it's an image, but it could be something outside of an image as well. Uh, and uh, the other side is a discriminator, which takes in the output from the generator and tries to tell whether or not that image is fake. So uh, so what you have, let's say, in this figure that you see on the right-hand side is you have a generator. The generator takes in some random noise. It converts that random noise to a fake image. And there is a discriminator, and the discriminator is trained to distinguish between a real image and a fake image. And uh, if if the discriminator cannot tell real from fake, then what that means is that your generator has gotten good enough that uh, the images that it is producing are as good as a real image. Uh, so uh, this is the essential process of uh, a generative adversarial network. And the generator's goal here is to produce data that is indistinguishable from real data. Okay, so how does it uh, work? So for the generative model, the input to a model is noise. So essentially you input some uh, sample noise to the uh, model and it, the model converts that noise into some kind of uh, data set. Um, usually, so the generative model is a neural network. It takes in some noise and it has its parameters and uh, the number, the kind of noise given to it usually has a very high dimensionality. Uh, essentially, then once you, what you do is you take that uh, uh, output, let's say it's an image, you feed it to the discriminative model, and the discriminative model tries to figure whether it is real or fake. So uh, how does the training for a GAN work? So GAN uh, starts with training the discriminator first. So first what you do with the GAN is uh, you start with uh, a set of real images. So let's say you have a large bunch of real images and some other uh, images that are not a part of the training, I mean, not a part of the training set. So you start by training the discriminator to be able to tell real from, uh, or the class that you're inter interested in versus the class that you're not interested in. Next, what it does is it receives real data from the, both real data from the data set and fake data generated by the uh, generator. So uh, when training the generator, our goal is to maximize the mistake rate for the discriminator. So essentially what you do is you reward the generator if the gen discriminator classifies uh, fake data as real. So uh, in order to train the generator, what we do is we take the discriminator's predictions on the fake data. That is how uh, closely does the discriminator, how closely is the discriminator able to tell that the particular data point is fake and 
you calculate the generator's loss based on that. And you take that loss and then update the generator's weight weights accordingly. So as the generator gets better, better you can also uh, feed, if the generator gets it correct, uh, correct you can also train the uh, discriminator to update its weight in order to detect uh, the in order to detect that uh, a particular image is a uh, fake but in general these two training uh, cycles are independent of each other that is you train the, you start by training the disc discriminator then you start by uh, i mean once the, uh, the discriminator is trained you fix the weights of the discriminator and uh, in the next step, you update the weights of the generator uh, based on the discriminator's uh, output of what the uh, of what the out uh, like what it is classifying for the uh, generator's output, and so on. Uh, GAN training, though, is a fairly hairy and finicky process. So one part is that that the two networks should be balanced with each other. That is. Uh, if your generator is always, I mean, if your discriminator is very good, that is, it, it's able to tell with a very high certainty that the generator is wrong, then in that case, the generator simply stops learning because it doesn't have enough signal to learn back. So in that case, what would happen is that there's something called mode collapse where the generator only learns with limited varieties of data. Or uh, it might happen that the generator figures out a particular mode in which uh, the it's able to pass through the discriminator. So a simil, uh, a very few kind of samples start being classified as real, whereas everything else is false. So in that case, what happens is that the output distribution is not as general as you would like. You start seeing similar images again and again, which pass through the uh, discriminator. A second thing that can happen is uh, non-convergence. That is, uh, the model simply does not converge very well. It keeps oscillating. So you find images going from one kind, I mean, like basically you have images that are not good at any point, you find different kinds of issues with the image and the uh, output or the generated images or the generated data points cycle between two uh, points, but not, uh, but not coming out as uh, what you would expect it to happen. Uh, Hyperparameter tuning in GANs is uh, like essentially a lot of trial and error. So things like learning rates, you have to tune the learning rates so that the uh, strength of the generator and discriminator is balanced. It's uh, essentially, it's a sort of equilibrium between uh, two networks fighting against each other. And if, uh, as long as both of them are balanced, you end up getting good output, but if they're not balanced, you will end up with uh, a mode collapse or other kinds of artifacts like that. Uh, last point is that uh, you require a fairly uh, you require a large amount of diverse training data in case you want to learn uh, you want the GAN to learn uh, realistic data distributions. So uh, to start off with, the models were fairly um, like they were able to generate fairly small amounts of uh, uh, fairly small sized images, but rapidly uh, people grew to make uh, I mean improve the model generation process to generate fairly realistic and large scale images. So uh, this is uh, from one of the papers by NVIDIA uh, where they generated images that were 1024 by 1024 uh, pixel sized. And you could see that uh, these are uh, pretty realistic images. If you look very closely, you can find artifacts which indicate that uh, the model, I mean, that these are AI generated images are not real. Uh, if you look closely, you can see, for example, that ears might be mismatched. Uh, eyes might occasionally be not exactly the same between two parts and so on, because some of the longer range correlations are lost. So, uh, but still it's uh, it's pretty realistic and good. Uh, I'll just show you some examples of what happens when a mode collapse happens. So for example, here you find on the top row, you find the same kind of image being generated again and again. That's maybe because this particular image or this particular type of image was able to pass through the discriminator uh, in uh, where the discriminator decided that this was okay. And then the uh, generator stopped learning and so on for different kinds of images. So uh, in this case, the GAN stopped converging as you would uh, want it to. Uh, okay, before I go on to the next section, uh, any questions here?
Okay, so the next part is about uh, transformers. So this is one of the most uh, question. Ah, so how do you train these GANs like this discriminator and the uh, generator? Uh, is it back propagation or do you do something? Yeah, like it's back propagation. No, it's back, back propagation. Yeah, these are neural networks. So all neural networks are trained essentially through back propagation. All right. Okay. So coming to transformers. So transformers originated from a paper called uh, Attention is All You Need from a set of Google researchers, none of whom are at Google anymore. But uh, ideally, since transformers have come into uh, the realm of machine learning, we are seeing almost every problem that is out there has been, every large scale problem that is out there has been tackled with transformers very effectively. So they're seen in text, they're seen in uh, images, audio, and uh, lately they're being applied to uh, video models as well. So what is attention? So attention in neural networks is uh, essentially a mechanism that allows the model to focus on certain parts of the input data more than others. So, essentially, so it's similar to how humans would react to let's say a noisy room where you're talking to the person opposite you and you sort of tune out all the other people and focus only on the person you are uh, talking to. So the way in which a neural network focuses its attention is having a, uh, like essentially it, it's, a, it's another matrix in the entire set of matrices that comprise the neural network where uh, the weights of that matrix are also learned by data. So uh, what attention is, is, uh, for, is a way for the model to focus on specific elements in the, of the data that it's processing, and which makes, it, which makes the uh, predictions better and generates uh, much more coherent outputs. So um, I haven't talked about the other kinds of neural networks that preceded uh, transformers. So networks like say recurrent neural networks or uh, uh, LSTMs, some of the issues with uh, those kind of networks, like recurrent neural networks had a model where uh, a model was able to focus, uh, a model was able to uh, take into account a series of data points, not just the initial data points. So essentially it was looking at uh, a certain uh, number of tokens, a certain number of data points in the past as well before it uh, predicted the next state. So what uh, attention changed is that the uh, these networks could look at the entire data set at one go. And to, uh, to be able to do that, they are able to use attention to focus on which part of the data set uh, being given to it is more relevant for the particular task at uh, hand. So the way in which uh, transformer models or large language models are trained is uh, often something called self-supervised learning. So uh, the way in which this works is you take a very large corpus of text. So for example, this might be text like Wikipedia, journal papers, uh, conversations in a site like Reddit and so on. And uh, the uh, task for the model is to predict. And what you do is you mask certain work, words out of this text. So for example, let's say uh, you have the sentence, a quick uh, brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. So let's say you randomly took masked two of the words and you ask the model to be able to figure out what the masked word is. And uh, as you train over the model, it uh, becomes better and better at figuring out what the uh, masked word is. Uh, it, the interesting part about this is that uh, when, you, when you do this over very large amounts of data, of data given to the model, the model is able to figure out all the kinds of rules that you would want it to learn about a language or, or even about a set of languages. So in this case, the uh, large corpus fed to the model, like let's say Reddit conversations, could be uh, several tens of terabytes in size. And uh, as you train the network, it learns what different words are. Uh, it learns how, to, uh, how they are um, organized and so on. And uh, it's even able to figure out how uh, it should, uh, let's say, how it should generate the next word. So in that case, so what happens is that if you are able to uh, feed any kind of sentence, the model is able to pick out very accurately what the next word or what the missing word in a particular sentence uh, would be. Uh, 
the interesting thing that has happened about this is that uh, people are now running out of text to be able to train their data sets on. So uh, companies that have a lot of uh, human written data sets are actually largely valued because of the value that these data sets contain. And another interesting thing that has been said about uh, this is that uh, right now what's happening is that a large amount of text that you're consuming, even in places like say Twitter or uh, Reddit or any of these kind of forums is written by AI. So you have a large number of bots that are actually uh, putting in the text, which means that given that it's not human generated text, if you were to train on this text, you are basically uh, feeding back on the output of the same model. So uh, companies that have access to pre-2020 data have a sort of golden opportunity to license the data sets to various companies. So recently, as you might've seen, like Reddit went public and its value is not so much in terms of what its users are doing now, but what its users did before. And some people have described uh, pre-2020 data sets as, for example, the equivalent of low background steel in physics, where uh, steel that was made before 1940 is called low background because it doesn't have radiation coming from the nuclear tests that have happened uh, since then. So uh, there is a certain advantage to having data sets that are definitely uh, human generated. Okay, so uh, another part that is that has been found when people trained large scale data sets is uh, something that was described as uh, people found several kinds of uh, scaling laws and they're called chinchilla scaling laws or other names uh, partly because these scaling laws came out uh, when a particular model called the chinchilla model was being trained but uh, the main point about them is that uh, what they found was that for a given uh, was the ideal amount of training that you would need to do for a given compute budget and a given amount of data that you have. So generally what they found was that training models with more data and fewer parameters are more effective than training larger models with uh, less data. And this contrasted with earlier beliefs emphasizing increasing model size. So one of the uh, earlier beliefs was that if you keep increasing model size, and we have seen that model size has become extremely large in uh, recent times. So previously people would consider like a one or 2 billion parameter model as large. And now we know that like chat GPT-4 is at least a 1.5 trillion parameter model. It's not public, but, and there are a large number of uh, several hundred billion parameters that are publicly available as well. Um, so what these findings propose is an optimal training regime, balancing the scale of the data set that is the amount of tokens that you can give to the training data set, uh, size of the model, and the compute budget uh, that you have. And the fact and that you need to, I mean, depending on the size of the training data set and so on, you can decide on an appropriate training model, uh, appropriate model size using these uh, scaling laws. Uh, so as I was talking about, uh, there are a large number of models that are available to you. Uh, if anybody's interested here, in this audience, I would certainly suggest that uh, you can try out small models, uh, small language models, even on a regular laptop. So something like say a 7 billion parameter Llama model or a Falcon 7 billion parameter model can be loaded on a 16 GB laptop with just a CPU and it will still work reasonably fine. It will be slow, like as in you generate maybe a word every couple of seconds, but uh, it's it's great for experimenting and you can get an idea of how these models are trained, how you can fine tune a model like that. And if you have access to more compute, uh, you can definitely, uh, like it's it's not out of the reach to have to be able to use your own 13 billion or even a 30 billion parameter model. Beyond that, uh, you may want to have, let's say a, spec, uh, a GPU or things like that, but uh, up to 30 billion parameters CPU, uh, uh, CPU inferencing is, slow, but not unreasonably slow. Like you would be able to see a word every second or so. And uh, here's a, the leaderboard on the site called Hugging Face, where a large number of uh, open source models are available. People fine tune them, people train them, people uh, compare them against each other. And you can see the models that are at the very top are now uh, nearing almost as good sometimes as uh, their closed source counterparts in many of the rankings. Uh, and the advantage of using your own model is that you're not restricted by what kind of restrictions are put by the 
chat GPT or Gemini or other models uh, like that, where some oftentimes you run into like, I'm not allowed to do that or things like that. Okay. Uh, any questions at this point? I've been speaking for some time. Okay. So um, I talked a bit Perhaps, about... Uh, uh, sorry, I have a question. Yeah. So how do I uh, actually interpret these rankings? Because, you know, like how do they compare against, let's say, ChatGPT or other closed source models? Uh, so there are a set of benchmarks, like uh, there are benchmarks, like I think one is called BLE or blue, uh, where uh, you give the model a certain set of questions and you look at the output and then you see how close the output is to what was expected from it. So that's how a model is uh, judged as better or worse compared to another model. So for example, oh. there's a bunch of tasks like let's say classification or inferencing or uh, so on. And uh, you just have a set of fixed answers and you try and see how close the model was able to get to the actual answer that it was supposed to be able to get. So he, here in this char, uh, image, you have some numbers at the right column, some average something. Is it like a score? And then how do I interpret this? So the score is, I think, averaged over a number of different benchmarks. Um, and uh, it's been averaged out in some way. So you have a set of benchmarks and you average out the score from different benchmarks and you rank them accordingly. Uh, so it's entirely possible that a model that is not as high in the rankings might do better for the particular task that you have at hand. Uh, also, you can see the size of the models, like in all the top models are 72B, which are 72 billion parameter models here. Uh, if you go all the way down to the very last one, we see a 34 billion by two MOE. So MOE indicates a mixture of experts. So a mixture of experts is a model that's a sparse uh, inferencing model. So these are different techniques in, which are used to uh, reduce, for example, inference compute costs and things like that. But uh, the way you interpret the score is that a higher score indicates that it is in general doing better over a wide range of tasks, may not necessarily be better at a particular specific task that you are interested in, um, but that's how you would interpret it. I don't know all the benchmarks that go into it, but I know there are a few tasks related to things like translation, things like classification, uh, answering regular questions around what might be expected for a language model to know things like, you know, what's the capital of a country and so on. So it has a range of questions which try to make sure that the model is answering uh, correctly. Or is right. it to text yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah. So, and, and I just wanted to know, like, how do I compare it against closed source models? So are these numbers, are these rank uh, scores available also for the closed source models? Yeah. Uh, you can also run the benchmark on a closed source model. So you don't need to know the parameters of a model to be able to run because you can give the same input to a closed source model and uh, get its output and compare to what the actual uh, output should be. So uh, these benchmarks are available for closed source models, as well as if you desire, you can actually run the benchmark for a closed source model as well. All right. Thanks. Oh, any other question? Okay. If not, uh, I'll go to a entirely so, different. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, so since inferencing uh, can be uh, largely of, uh, significantly uh, influenced by the amount of compute power, how can it be uh, fairly judged among different models? Uh, inferencing is. Uh... Like it's inferencing is largely a function of the number of parameters that are used to compute the output for a model. So it's uh, so what you would do is you would be able to, I mean, you can judge it uh, in terms of a large model, like for a single, for a model like a 72 billion parameter model, it'll be all your parameters are being used. The cases where things become different is uh, when you start doing special things with your model. So for example, uh, mixture of experts. So that is one way in which uh, I'm not as familiar with mixture of experts, but essentially a part of it is uh, splitting the network into different components, which are so-called experts. And the model routes 
some of the computations to one expert or the other, depending on what the input is. And that way, not all the parameters of the model are used. So in case you have a, uh, a large model, like a trillion parameter model, which is split between a number of GPUs, uh, you're not using compute on every single uh, GPU out there. A second way in which uh, inferencing costs can be reduced is, uh, and this is very clever and uh, is now becoming its own uh, field of activity, is by quantizing the models. So uh, if you look at the third from the bottom model, it says F16. What it means is that it's a floating point 16 uh, model. Uh, but people have found that you can say reduce instead of 16, uh, uh, instead of 16 bit floating point representation, you can have an eight bit floating point representation, or you could even have a four bit uh, representation. So what that means is that the number of values that a particular uh, weight can take are significantly reduced but uh, the model and the model's expressivity reduces, but maybe not by as much. So in that case, you can, uh, the amount of the total size of the model reduces drastically. It also reduces the uh, capacity or the, I mean, the score of a model, but hopefully not by as much. So it makes it possible to run a large number of parameters on a smaller uh, GPU or uh, like make maybe make it run faster or things like that. Uh, another advantage of uh, many of these quantized models is that uh, there are techniques which are, and I didn't intend to talk about it, but since it's come up, I'll uh, just give a brief idea about them so that if anybody wants, you can look them up in more detail, is uh, techniques called low rank uh, adaptation, LoRa or quantized low rank adaptation, that is QLoRa. So, uh, Essentially, the idea is that if you want to fine tune a model, that is, you take a model and you want to fine tune it to a particular kind of domain that you have. So uh, what that means is that these models are trained on general English text without any particular uh, domain that they're targeted towards. But let's say you only want, I mean, you want your model to be much, much better at, uh, let's say, medical uh, knowledge. So in that case, what you would do is you would, uh, you can, take the model that you have, which has been trained generally, and you'd give additional training data, which is coming from only the domain that you are interested in. And that means that the model weights would optimize themselves towards the particular domain that you are training it for at the expense maybe of the larger domain that it is, I mean, of the general knowledge that it is uh, ignoring. Now that can be a fairly expensive process because you have to hold all the, uh, weights in memory, uh, you have to compute the gradients, you have to pass, I mean, you have to add these, I mean, you have to do all the training and so on for the entire model, which is uh, fairly large. So what uh, techniques like low rank adaptation do is, uh, if you remember your matrix algebra, uh, the rank of a matrix is essentially uh, how, uh, like the number of uh, rows or column, independent rows or columns you have in a matrix. So let's say you have a large 72 billion parameter matrix and you don't want to, uh, you, you're not able to hold all those 72 billion parameters in your training. So what you can do is, let's say you take two matrices of a lower rank, which multiply to be of the same size as your 72 billion parameter matrix. Now this will not be completely as good as your, I mean, as training the 72 billion parameter matrix directly, but you take two smaller matrices, which when multiplied, give you a 72 billion parameter matrix, and you only train these two smaller matrices, which can be much, much smaller because uh, you are dealing with a low rank matrix. Now, in that case, you are still training these parameters and it's not necessarily, it's unlikely to be as good as training the entire matrix, but because your space savings are so large, uh, you can often get away with uh, having a much, much smaller amount of compute to work with. So that is called low rank uh, adaptation, LoRa, L-O-R-A, uh, and the quantized version where you try and uh, reduce the number of uh, bits of your, uh, uh, number of bits of the representation, I mean, of the parameters that you're using. So instead of using the full 16 bit uh, uh, weights, you could use like eight or four bit uh, weights and you can do another round of saving on top of that. So you can use a very large model, but quantize it. So these are some of the techniques that can be used to uh, train these gigantic models even 
with uh, limited uh, compute resources. Uh, okay, uh, so this was a digression. Any questions around here? So I had a question um, just in regards to attention that you spoke about. Is it the um, same as weights or is it different from it? Uh, so attention is a type of weight. Like essentially, these are all matrices. So yeah. And these are these are trained. I mean, the weights are also not uh, manually added in. The weights automatically come about as a part of the training process. So are weights in relative to each other, the input data and attention implies a weight given within that input data, a particular input data. Is it like mm -hmm. that or is it different? No, it is. It is like that. So uh, the attention weights would be like for the same for all data sets, but which weight gets valued depends on what the input uh, data is. So for example, this comes in useful in case somebody's in case you have a, let's say a text stream coming in, which says uh, uh, something like, uh, uh, let's say a simple case, a simple sentence like, uh, John was in his office today. Uh, his coat was, he forgot his coat over there. So now if you look at the second sentence, he forgot his coat. So he, in this case, refers to John in the earlier sentence. And the attention matrix is able to map, uh, which, I mean, like given a large context, uh, it's able to accurately map which uh, what these different parts uh, of a sentence refer to each other. So it would be uh, like, it would be able to give a larger weight to John when you are looking at he in the uh, second sentence. So that's how attention is able to uh, focus on different parts of a sentence. Right, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? Here? Okay, if not, uh, I'll go on to another part, another kind of model. The reason I bring broad dif uh, dif uh, transformers before diffusion models is that uh, this connects to other kinds of models like uh, DALI and so on, which I'll talk about, where uh, these kind, where diffusion comes into a, a role uh, for generating images. So what are diffusion models? So diffusion models are a class of models where... Uh, the uh, where the model learns a data distribution by uh, iteratively corrupting the data and then learning how to reverse the process. So diffusion, as you know, is uh, simply a process where uh, you can take a data point and uh, corrupt it using, say, a Gaussian noise. And eventually, like if you do it a large enough number of times, you end up with a pure noise. So the top row of image here indicates a forward diffusion process. So you start with a clean image, you add some noise, you add some noise, you keep adding noise until you end up with a no, uh, an image that is indistinguishable from the data. Now, what uh, you want to do is to learn how to reverse this process so that there is a, so given a noisy data set, you are able to recreate the original uh, image back. So you have the reverse diffusion process. So, uh, the forward diffusion process, you train, I mean, you add noise in a large number of steps. The steps can be as large as a few thousand or uh, in that kind of a range. Uh, on the reverse diffusion process, what you do is you train the neural network to reverse the diffusion process and reconstruct the original data. And uh, this process works pretty well. You can apply it to a large kind of uh, different data types, for example, images, audio and uh, lately video as well, given enough compute. It does require a lot of compute, but uh, an advantage of diffusion over GANs is that uh, GANs are much, much, much more finicky about uh, being trained. So you require, you're requiring to train two uh, different neural networks with uh, different uh, learning rates. You have to balance the learning rates. You often end up with things like mode collapse or other issues which prevent the network from generalizing as well as you would like. Whereas diffusion being a much more cleaner process is uh, far easier to work with. So um, this is like briefly how you would uh, train a diffusion model. So you start by corrupting the data with Gaussian noise uh, over a large number of diffusion steps and you turn the, your data into pure noise. And on the denoising side or uh, 
learning how to uncorrupt the image, uh, you, you train the model to predict the noise that was added, effectively learning to uh, denoise the data. Okay, so uh, and the way the parameter optimization works is that the model parameters are optimized to minimize the difference between predicted noise and the actual noise that was added during the diffusion process. So diffusion uh, by adding Gaussian noise is one of the ways. Uh, there was another uh, like recent as in about a year back paper which showed which tried to use a bunch of other kind of regular physical processes like uh, Poisson diffusion, uh, Poisson processes and so on to corrupt the data. And they found that it works well under different conditions. So this is uh, only one of the natural kind of processes that adds noise. Uh, you can use other noise generating processes as well to generate and to create a generative model that is uh, pretty exp uh, expressive. So uh, on the inferencing side, what you do is you start with uh, pure noise. Once you have trained the model, you can start with pure noise and you start denoising the data by predicting and subtracting the added noise at uh, each step. And what the model has learned uh, from the distribute, I mean, if you have trained the model on a large enough number of images, it tries to get back to an image that it has from the distribution that it has uh, learned from. And the best part about diffusion is that you can do conditional guidance. So similar to how we could uh, use uh, variational autoencoders condition on different parts of, uh, on let's say a particular feature, you can condition a diffusion model on additional inputs, like say text prompts or class labels to guide the generation process towards a desired output. So this is how uh, image generation models like DALI work. So I think all of you might have heard of uh, DALI 2 and it's available via ChatGPT. Uh, sorry, DALI 2 is, uh, yeah, it's available via ChatGPT. Uh, and there are a bunch of other models like Imagine from Google and so on, which all work more or less on the same principle with a different number, different kinds of training data sets and uh, weights and so on. But what you have in this particular model is that uh, uh, you have a diffusion process that is conditioned on a text prompt. So let's look at briefly how uh, that works. So uh, to look at that, there is another model that I'll briefly talk about that is called CLIP. And CLIP stands for Contrastive Language Image uh, Pre-Training. So what uh, the CLIP model is trained on is that it is trained to understand and associate images with, uh, it, with different uh, textual captions. So what they did was you took images which had a particular caption associated with it and uh, a bunch of images, a bunch of captions that had nothing to do with the image. And they performed something called contrastive pre-training. So what contrastive pre-training does is it uh, tries to maximize, uh, to teach the model to distinguish between matching and non-matching pairs of data. So in this case, uh, the matching part is in case the uh, image is matched to a particular caption, and the second case, the image is not matched to a particular caption. So what contrastive uh, uh, loss does is it tries to maximize the loss when the difference is when it's different and uh, minimize when it is uh, the same. So uh, you present the model with pairs of images and the corresponding text captions. And for each matching caption that describes the image, uh, the model's task is to predict which caption correctly matches the image among the set of uh, possible captions. So uh, that is the clip model, which associates, uh, which learns a joint representation of images and their corresponding prompts. So uh, this is like a high level overview. I took this image from the paper itself. Uh, what we have is uh, on the top part, on the top part above the dotted line, let's say you have a text encoder, which takes in a text prompt, like a corgi playing a flame throwing trumpet. Uh, and the image encoder on the other side, which has an image which corresponds to uh, that particular image, uh, which has an image that corresponds to the particular uh, prompt or, or the text caption uh, given to it. Now, below the dotted line, what happens is the text to image generation process. So once you have trained the model, uh, your, click, your text embedding is uh, fed to a diffusion prior to produce an image embedding. And what this does is that uh, the uh, the diffusion process is, or the, uh, the the process of reversing the diffusion is conditioned on the caption that is given uh, to the 
uh, model. So what it does is it brings the image as close as possible to the text prompt that was given to it. And surprisingly enough, it learns very well uh, all kinds of images, all, all kinds of uh, nuances that you might expect it to learn. So uh, for example, in this case, you have like a, and it can also learn things that it can also uh, represent images that are not in its training set. So for example, something like a teddy bear roller skating on Times Square would not be one of the images that it has seen, but it would have seen enough people, enough images of somebody roller skating, enough images of Times Square, enough images of teddy bears that it can put together a realistic image uh, synthesizing all, uh, all these elements that are given to it. So for example, some of these images that are generated through uh, the DALI 2 model is uh, given here. Like for example, the top one is a high quality photo of a dog playing in a field next to a lake. And you can see that it has largely gotten everything correct. Uh, if you look very closely, you can see that uh, it, it is an AI generated image because it shows certain things that are not physically possible. And for a long time, uh, things like number of fingers or uh, hands not drawn correctly and so on were an issue. But lately, most of those issues have been solved to the point where uh, these images are gotten good to the point that it's very hard to tell whether it is a AI generated image or a real image. So, I mean, if you look very, very closely, you can still see certain things missing in AI generated images, particularly like uh, sometimes things like a uh, fine structure of fingers or hands. Uh, sometimes you might have, uh, like, especially if hands are folded together or so on, the fingers can go off, but these are, these would be solved at some point. Another thing that DALI 2 itself was not very good at was generating text captions. So if you'd ask it to generate text, it would generate something that looked like text, but it would not necessarily be what you asked it to generate. And that has also been largely solved with um, some of the more recent models uh, from like stability and so on. Uh, another part that people discovered was that while transformers initially came about from NLP research or text research, uh, they didn't particularly have to be limited to uh, text. So, uh, for example, people applied them, started applying them to uh, images, and it's done in a fairly similar way to how you could you would apply it to text. That is, as I was showing you, that you take it, a particular piece of text and you mask it. So you remove certain words and ask the model to predict the word that is missing. In a vision transformer, what you do is you break an image into a smaller uh, bit. So in this case, for example, you can see that the image is broken into three by three patches um, and you remove one of the patches uh, randomly and ask the image, ask the model to predict the missing patch. And uh, uh, if you train enough, you learn that the transformer is able to learn the elements of images just as it was able to learn about uh, text earlier. And uh, it's actually able to do it much easier than it's able to learn text. So uh, one thing that might surprise some of the people here is that uh, text models are much, much, much more heavier than image models. So the number of parameters required to have a very realistic text output is often in the tens of billions or at least hundreds of billions. Uh, like for example, good text models are, let's say 30 to at least 30 billion parameters long. Otherwise the output can be choppy at times, and you would know that it is not human generated. Whereas uh, image models can be fairly small. So a model like DALI2, I think was uh, just a billion parameters or so. And uh, those number of parameters are able to generate a fairly accurate images. And uh, one way in which you might be able to intuit that this should be the case is that uh, we are much more forgiving when uh, like when an image is slightly off. So let's say the image that is generated, if a few pixels were different or the color was slightly off, you'd barely detect it. You'd still be able to tell a dog is a dog, even if some parts of the dog were misplaced. But uh, in a text, even if uh, a particular character goes from, let's say uh, an A to an I, uh, you would know that it's a typo or it's a mistake and so on. So uh, you, uh, So we require far more accuracy from text models than we do from image models. So the number of parameters correspondingly is much more in uh, uh, text models for a similar level of being convincing that we would like. Uh, okay, so finally, I'm coming to an end of my talk. So uh, 
what happens in the future. So uh, one thing as I was mentioning before is that uh, we are running out of large scale data to train a lot of models on. Uh, people have already tapped out as much text data as they could. Um, image data is going uh, is getting close to getting tap tapped out. So the big fi future frontier is uh, videos. Uh, Google and others are particularly looking to tap into the gigantic, huge uh, corpus of uh, video data that has been uploaded into places like YouTube and so on to train. The idea is that you feed a huge amount of video data and the model would not only be able to learn about creating videos, but also be able to figure out things like physics and so on just by watching the data sets. And it does seem that some of it is possible, of course, not everything, but models are able to convincingly recreate things like uh, splashing water drops or uh, bouncing balls and things like that reasonably convincingly. So uh, there is a lot more to be done. Uh, essentially, like video is a huge Un underexplored uh, uh, resource, I would say. So uh, that's about it. So yeah, thank you. And uh, I'd be able to, happy to take any questions here. We have about uh, 10 minutes, I think. Uh... Hello, Farad. I have a question here. So this is regarding the uh, diffusion process, which you mentioned. So noise is injected in, in that process. And, uh, and you said that other than the Gaussian noise, other kinds of noises have also been tried, like Poisson noise and all. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, uh, uh, so when, when you try different kinds of noises and you have compare the results, uh, how does it depend on the on the on the power spectrum of the noise? So, like white noise versus red noise, has that been tried, or does it affect the results, or not at all, or any ideas? Uh, I'm not sure. I've not uh, looked at that. Um, mm -hmm. um, I would have to look it up and see what uh, the I mean, how different kinds of noise uh, add uh, vary the output from the model. Uh, I do remember reading that. Uh, certain kinds of noise produce better images of uh, for certain domains so for example uh, like the idea was that if you add the kind of noise that the model is trying to physically represent uh, it would uh, do a better job and we don't need to be uh, restricted to gaussian noise itself uh, given that it's been a year and this idea hasn't taken off significantly i suppose the answer i mean i suppose that it isn't meaningfully better so maybe it was just a digression and it didn't take off. Maybe there are other reasons why it didn't take off, for example, uh, computational complexity or something like that, given that uh, Gaussian processes are very easy to set up uh, in computer code and model in GPUs and so on. So there might be other reasons, but yeah. uh, yes. I don't uh, know. Yeah. yeah, I understand. So the Gauss Gaussian process can be, it need, need not necessarily be white, right? So it, it could there could be correlations in time and all that. So. That was what actually I was wondering. But anyway, thank you. So uh, I can also try to look up some of the works. Thank you. Uh, Farad, I had a kind of a, a question regarding the ethics of building uh, one's own large language models. I mean, you said that you know anyone can actually build a LLM these days without the restrictions that are there in the closed source models. But, uh, you know, so some of those restrictions have been put in place for a reason. So, uh, you know, given that if you build your own LLM and, you know, release it in the open, you can do kind of sort of unethical things. Does that worry you? Um, not very much, to be honest, partly because, uh, yeah, it, it is a possibility that you could do it. Um, but uh, like you're right that some of the things that uh, like OpenAI or other models that have been released publicly try to minimize like for example if you ask the model how do I create a pipe bomb it will tell you no so uh, but if somebody is determined enough those kind of things because the models have been trained on internet data uh, they are available out there so it's a matter of uh, how determined you are uh, it does make it easy but the other part that 
sort of cancels out for this is that uh, it uh, models often hallucinate. That's something that I didn't talk about at all. And what is hallucination? That is essentially uh, outputting, uh, confidently outputting things that are not correct. Um, so you, you are unlikely to be able to take many of these things at face value and still be successful. Uh, one part that it does make it uh, like the ethics of uh, certain things, like for example, creating bots that mimic humans. Uh, so in that case, it is possible that uh, people can be swayed by bots. Uh, people are in general uh, not as discriminative as uh, some of us might assume them to be. Uh, and I'll I'll go a brief digression onto one of the cases that happened very recently. Uh, maybe some of you might have read about it. Uh, there is a company called Character.ai. And what Character.ai does is it creates uh, these uh, bots that are essentially personalized to a person. So you can develop a relationship with a bot and that particular bot remembers what conversations you've had previously and so on. And they even market them as like your virtual boyfriend or girlfriend and so on. And what they found was that uh, people started having fairly uh, raunchy conversations with their bots and so on. And as every company, they wanted to at some point go public and so on. And they thought that uh, given the kind of conversations their clients were having with their bots, uh, this was a risk to the company. So uh, what they did was they updated the models so that the models were not as likely to uh, like basically not be as not safe for work. So they were likely less likely to respond to raunchy requests from their clients and so on. And what they found was that a lot of clients or almost all of them reacted extremely negatively to that kind of a change where some of them said that it felt like their partner had died or uh, that uh, they were extremely sad because the other person is, and they often, they talked about them as if they were persons is not responding to them as they were before, they're not as loving and so on. And this indicates, uh, I mean, I, I think at some point there would be some kind of regulation that uh, would come in. So like, for example, people who believe that there are, they have these uh, partners, virtual partners and so on. And uh, we see things like, for example, uh, what would I call it? The fishing industry where people uh, convince uh, particularly seniors to hand over their uh, financial details or things like that. Uh, these bots can be good enough to be very convincing, very empathetic. I mean, they can be far more empathetic than humans can be because a bot trained to be empathetic has no limits about, you know, validating you all the time, regardless of how destructive or how unreasonable you are being and so on. So yeah, it's an ethical minefield. I don't think into delve into it very much, but uh, it is a concern. At some point, I think uh, we would have some level of regulation over consumer bots. Um, there is one company that I know that is trying to that is marketing a model which says that it can bring your loved ones back from death. That is, you give it a set of conversations that you had with somebody who has died, and it will train its model, and you can have a conversation with somebody who has died. And now this is something that creeps me out quite a bit. So. Uh, you're right that this is there. Uh, I don't know what, like, what kind of regulation would it be? And uh, in general, I am uh, less likely to approve of regulation before something has happened than after it has happened, because uh, there are calls that uh, AI research be stopped for a certain period of time, or we have limits on the kind of models that can be developed. And even India recently tried that all uh, large language models should be uh, approved by the government before they're deployed and then they went back on it and so on. But uh, yeah, there is there is a lot of uh, back and forth on this particular part. Um, uh, I had another question. So, uh, you know, you mentioned hallucination and this is something that uh, we have encountered a few times. So, you know, uh, uh, kind of a couple of years back, Pranay Goel at Iser told me about this possibility of using bots to write scraps of code uh, mm -hmm. in Python and so on. And so I mentioned this uh, back in my institute and, uh, you know, some of my group actually tried it out and they told me that, you know, many times it will confidently output a code which actually is not correct at all. So, you know, um, 
isn't this kind of a you know big problem where you don't know whether to trust uh, you know the output so you know like part of the reason why you're using it is so that you know you can use something which is usable so mm. uh, so th there are different parts to this like when you want something factual or so on like when you want something creative hallucination is a sort of asset like if you're trying to write a novel and you want to flesh out a character uh that's perfectly fine like what we call hallucination is essentially like answering correctly or incorrectly for the model is not any different one part is not any different from the other it's not like one is correct and one is hallucinated it's just that it's a series of probabilities of certain tokens being generated and that is all there is so if it says like the capital of india is uh washington uh it's just that the model's parameters might have i mean the output probability of wash was higher than the output probability of say delhi so uh in general the way in which you would combat hallucination is two ways one is you make sure that the correct training data is so much that it overwhelms anything else uh in terms of what you encountered on coding that is definitely there and i've encountered it a lot as well and particularly when you're trying to automate tasks like not just write code but let's say make api calls to do certain things uh these models will happily create api calls that don't exist at all um and sometimes or create a correct api call but in case data is missing it'll fill it with something that is sort of okay but maybe not what you wanted and that can be very dangerous when these apis are let's say performing a certain task like let's say uh uh if it's been uh like let's say you have an api call to transfer a certain amount of funds from one account to another and it wasn't specified what the other account would be or maybe the other account is wrong in that case the model hallucinates and puts in something that should not be there so you could have a fund transfer that goes to an account that does not exist so things like that are uh concerns uh so some of it can be combated by like not being completely trusting of a model's output so you can see like uh, and this is uh, again if you look in re into research papers uh and search for things like as a large language model i am not allowed to you'll find huge numbers of papers that have phrases like these which indicate that these papers were not only written by chat gpt nobody even reviewed them the reviewers didn't read them the writers themselves did not uh, read them and things like that uh, or other kinds of telltale phrases that indicate that a large language model has been used to write something uh, particularly uh, another part that has been there is uh, people tried using a large language model to diagnose certain things and the good part about that is that it appears to be very accurate you have an empathetic doctor that listens to all your complaints and provides your diagnosis and so on but then they found that regardless of what you did like for example uh recently somebody gave the mri of a fish to different uh, large language models which could accept multimodal input and the model confidently went ahead and said that this is the cervical section of a human and this person suffers from so and so and so on except for one model i think gemini had it in its training data where it said that this is a mri of a salmon so uh you have to be you have to be aware of the fact that these models are not infallible and are not only not infallible they can go wrong uh severe i mean severely or marginally and coding part is certainly right like the va the variational autoencoder that i showed in this talk was generated using chat gpt but uh, or large parts of it were generated using chat gpt but i had to iterate over it multiple times to get it completely correct now i could have written the code myself but i thought i'd just use it and once you start using it you don't feel like i mean it's like correcting somebody else's code you feel like you don't want to deal with it so what i did was kept feeding it back like kept feeding the errors back into chat gpt and at least with uh, larger context windows like the amount of data you can give it and the fact that it stores previous interactions it was able to correct each of the errors that it was getting until it finally got a running version that uh, i presented in this uh, talk uh, so yeah like uh, uh, be aware that models hallucinate all models hallucinate to varying degrees uh, and uh, also another thing that uh, at least for users i would say is that for many questions that you might put to a large language model the models have a certain uh, like as you said a particular political view in mind and often 
most of the public models that you have, like ChatGPT or Bard or Gemini or uh, Anthropics Cloud, they are all extremely left of center. Uh, so when you're asking questions about economic policies or things like that, it comes with a certain viewpoint, which you need to correct for uh, and be aware of that this is not uh, this is not a centrist opinion. This is or this is not like it's very hard to get, let's say, a right of center opinion from a large language model, a public large language model. So um, just be aware of these kind of things. Uh, are there any further questions? Yeah. Um, hi, Farad. So, slight change of uh, topic, maybe. So, you were talking about GANs and their problems. So, I've been uh, looking at uh, some of the literature on generating synthetic tabular data and the argument or one of the motivations, uh, well, there are two possible motivations. One is um, to generate larger, so for example, in biomedical applications, uh, um, predicting patient outcomes and so on. One issue is that it's very hard sometimes to publicly share this data. And so if you can share equally good uh, fake data, um, then that would work. So there is a program called CTGAN, for example, that does that and a few others. Um, they all date back to three, four years back. And uh, we found they didn't actually work terribly well as in, uh, and I was just wondering, in uh, do you think this is, uh, I, I was a little bit skeptical in particular of, can you really improve the performance of a machine learning model by just dumping a large amount of synthetic data on it, which is itself generated from a smaller quantity of real data, because that seems to be the motivation in some of the papers I've read. Yeah. And secondly, can a synthetic data set approach the, quality of the real data set in terms of you train a model on one or on the other, um, they both do equally well on held out real data. Uh, yeah, uh, great question. Yeah, uh, great question. Uh, so uh, one part is true that uh, CTGAN is something that I was aware of, partly because I looked into it for exactly the same purpose for trying to see if it can mimic tabular data well. And uh, for some cases it works, but uh, if your if your data has a lot of uh, categories and so on, I think it doesn't do uh, as well. Um, so it's possible to improve some of this. Now the question of whether your data is good, uh, whether synthetic data can be made good enough to uh, be as good as uh, real data, so that you can, for example, train models on or use it to augment uh, limited amount of training data is a hard question. It depends on your use case. Uh, and uh, in some cases, like for example, let's say some of the use cases I've seen, uh, let's say a bank wants to release a certain amount of data for modeling to other people where it does not want to share real data. This can often be done reasonably well because let's say transactions are often of a certain size. And as long as your training data is large enough, you might be able to approximate it well enough. Uh, in cases where you have things like location data and so on, this can be much more messier because uh, it, it's it's data that does not follow a very it does not follow a good distribution, so uh, it may not be able to mimic it that well. Overall, uh, question of whether synthetic data can be as good, uh, it depends on what is the end goal that you're looking at, like. It can sometimes be used to generalize a model. If your uh, model, I mean, if you're dealing with uh, small amounts of data, it can and does help with generalizing, like even certain, like essentially certain kinds of data augmentation techniques. Like let's say you take an image and to create more images, you might rotate an image or uh, take the mirror image and things like that. Those are fairly simple transformations and would increase uh, the amount of data that you have. Uh, at at some expense of generalization, but hopefully it would still end up with a better model than uh, what you started off with without any augmented data. But uh, other parts where uh, uh, like uh, it it can be more dangerous when it comes to medical applications and so on. Like one part that worries me sometimes is that a fairly large amount of uh, 
training data for uh, self-driving cars and so on comes from data generated using games such as uh, uh, Grand Theft Auto or similar simulators. So what they did was they generated uh, training data from uh, uh, either people playing those games or just uh, uh, running those games through a simulator and uh, then used it to train those models. So now, depending on how good the uh, various components of the models in those games, uh, uh, of the models that are used to generate the characters and images in those games are your models that are being used to train, uh, uh, say, models that are going to be behind uh, the operations of a self-driving car uh, would be there. So uh, we trust our lives to these models. But uh, as to how good they are, um, I don't know, like as in, I don't, I can't quantify it. It's certainly better than nothing in some cases. If, uh, uh, like I would, I would like to take a strong look at each of the data sets generated to see whether the distributions are actually as good as uh, the original distribution that you started with, off with. And uh, sometimes even eyeballing the distributions can tell you that the GAN hasn't learned it that well. GANs particularly are not as good at sometimes uh, understanding the distribution uh, due to things like mode collapse or not having enough, uh, I mean, for tabular data and so on, sometimes there may just not be uh, enough variety in your data set for it to learn the distribution well. Uh, in, and even in case of images, you require a fairly large number of images to be able to generalize well. So uh, that's why for GANs, uh, unlike diffusion models, uh, GANs tend to work within a certain domain. So you would see GANs for, let's say, faces or bedrooms and so on, but not a generic, like there is no GAN for taking a caption and generating an image corresponding to that, because uh, a GAN would not be able to do that uh, very effectively. Maybe I don't know. Maybe that's a good topic. Like, would you would you be able to create something like a diffusion model for uh, tabular data? It, I don't see, but it should not be possible. It should be possible, and maybe it might do better. Uh, and did I answer your question? Sorry, I didn't have the mic. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, no, you did. Um, and clearly it's an open topic. And I was also thinking, uh, can diffusion models do better in this case? And I think like two years back, I have seen uh, a GAN based image generator that was floating around as a collab notebook. This was before or around the time Dali and all were becoming big. Um, mm -hmm. Probably diffusion models do better, but I thought GANs originally arose with that motivation, like being able to generate images with just a verbal description kind of thing. Uh, might yeah, be wrong. So they're able to generate images for a particular class of images, uh, but not generic uh, descriptions. Like for example, with diffusion models and uh, like for example, for DALI, you can give a caption like, uh, make me a cat smoking a cigar like Sherlock Holmes set in uh, 18th century England or something like that, and it would be able to do a convincing job. Uh, I don't think a GAN would be able to do anything uh, close to that. Like it, it would be able to do it for a particular class. Like you can have a cat, you can have a cigar, you can have maybe a cat smoking a cigar, but all of those together would become less and less uh, likely. But since you brought up Colab, I wanted to tell all the students here particularly that uh, Collab is a great resource for trying out many of the models that you may not be able to on limited computational resources. So um, I've experimented with many of these diffusion models or GANs, uh, image generation GANs, which require, let's say, a GPU with uh, doing it on Collab. And you can get pretty interesting results. You can experiment with them. You can see what happens with uh, when you change parameter sizes or what kind of outputs you can get and so on. So yeah, like uh, thanks for bringing Collab up, but Collab is a great resource in case you don't have your own comp like extreme compute resources that sometimes larger models require. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Farhat. Uh, really appreciate you, uh, you know, remaining awake so late in the night to give us these talks. And uh, I very much hope that the next time you're here uh, in India, do please visit us 
in person. So Thanks. let's so let's give Farhat a big hand for his lectures. Thank you. All right, Farhat. See you. Um, Farhat, can you hear us? I, I, uh, so there's coffee outside and we'll be back here at 12.